We are, uh, for everybody that's wondering where we're at and where this puts us, we have just lost the king. Solomon has uh, passed away and come to the end of his line. And uh, his son has been ready and prepared for the job, supposedly, is taken over. And there's got to be a lot of nervousness in the uh, Jerusalem Gazette staff and uh, the rest of the nation and the, the press has to be kind of unsure about what's going on right now because the, uh, the king has prepared this son to be, or at least had planned for this son to replace him. And uh, you have to wonder how comfortable Solomon was with that choice because when you read his Proverbs written apparently earlier in his reign and earlier in his time, he spent a whole slug of verses talking about the need for wisdom and the need to be a wise son and a lot of other things to do with just having your head on straight and having your priorities right. And you have to wonder, was he trying to be proactive and introduce these ideas for a son that he hoped was going to do fine? Or was he seeing early on things in this son that would make him nervous? And I kind of tend to lean towards the latter, that maybe there was some nervous level that uh, there was a, a son that was showing signs of not being real smart in some way. And uh, he certainly is going to live that out for us as he begins to take over. We need some more chairs, and we got enough. We got things back. There's a bunch more up here, Scott. You can grab if you need to. Anyway, so we've got this new sun taking over, and it's this chapter as it starts out. We looked at it a little last time, and Sue has asked the question about Shechem because it's interesting that it just starts out. And here he went. And in verse 1 of chapter 12, as well as verse 1 of chapter 10 in Chronicles, it says, Then Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And if you just read through that, you'll just go, oh, okay. So they went to this place called Shechem. No big deal. And must have been, you know, the hot spot or it was... You know, like having your convention in Hawaii or whatever, it's just a nice place to go. So you do that. The only problem with that is you've got to remember that we are talking about the United Kingdom, and there's this little place down here called Jerusalem. And that has become what to the nation? That's the capital of the nation. What are the things there that would draw you to that place as a capital? Good malls. Good malls. <laughs> of course. What else would it be? That's where the palace is. Okay. The palace is the temple. Why would having the temple there have anything to do with what you might do with a king? Particularly in this land. And why would the temple care, the religious center, care one way or another about who was king? God's direction. Ah. God wanted. Because there's something special about the line of this king <coughs> that started with a guy named David, right? And David had a promise that. From him would come all the way down and said, you will never, I'm promising you that there will be one in your line all the way down. So we got Solomon, and then you got Rehoboam, and then you got all these other guys, and they point all the way down to, uh, so there's the Davidic covenant in there, which has everything to do 
with the temple because the temple is the place where God says, I will choose to dwell with my people here. So if you're going to crown a new king in this nation, it is going to be linked into that somehow. <coughs> and so you would think that the logical place that the new king is going to be enthroned or put into office, it's going to happen in Jerusalem where the palace is, the seat of government is there, the temple is there, everything's there, and the book opens up and says Rehoboam went to Shechem. And you go, that just seems odd. So the least we should do is look at Shechem and say, is there something really important about Shechem that maybe that's what draws you there? So you go and look, and you found that Valley of Shechem sits between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And that just means everything to you, right? <laughs> Suffice it to say, it's up in this neck of the woods. It's north, about 34 miles from Jerusalem. So, that way. And at this place, there are two mountains that sit side by side. They're like this. And there's uh, one on the north and one on the south. And you got Ebal. And you have Gerizim over here. And there's a valley in between there, and that's where this place called Shechem is. It is an interesting place in the history of the nation because in Genesis, Abraham was there. And he did something there important. He came in, he built an altar here. Very first altar in the land after he came <coughs> into the promised land. So this is where he built an altar. We have uh, another character that uh, showed up in Genesis a little bit later. And he actually bought a piece here. Abraham, so we got Abe up there first. Then we got Jacob. And Jacob bought a piece of property there. <clears throat> and he dug something there that pops up much later in history. Big hole in the ground that happens to have water in it. Jacob's well is there in Shechem. In a place later called Samaria, where a certain woman one day was drawing water. A Samaritan woman story happens in that very location. So there's some history there. It's uh, the place where Joshua left his second parting message to the nation at that place in Shechem. So it was important for that. It was a city of refuge for the whole northern area. Remember the city of refuge? If you had accidentally killed somebody and the family was out to get your hide, you could run to the city of refuge and if you stayed within its walls until the high priest died, you were safe from being killed by the family getting revenge for that. Now it wasn't for murder, but for manslaughter where someone died due to their <coughs> actions that weren't intentional. So, city of refuge, so it was an important city from that standpoint. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a busy place with lots going on, and it happens to be within the territory of one tribe. It's in Ephraim. Oops. And as much history and everything is going on in this place, and as significant it is within the nation, I don't believe, and most commentators don't believe, that that's why he had to go to Shechem. Most everybody agrees the reason he went to Shechem is because of this. Because it's in Ephraim. And the problem, what's the problem with Ephraim? Well, there was this little incident right at the end of Solomon's reign where God said, Solomon, I promised you that your son would be there and that you would, have, you would reign over this as long as you followed my list of instructions. And Solomon didn't follow that list of instructions and he went to the guy named 
Cherry bomb. And he said, you pick out for yourself 10 pieces of this robe, I'm going to give it to you. Only thing about Jeroboam was he's young, he's smart, you'll remember, he's ambitious, and he said, good, because our people have been treated like dirt for way too long, and this tribe of Judah just thinks it's so doggone smart and so bossy, and we're bigger, and we're better, and we're more important, and since... I got this promise anyway, I'm going to take it now. That's what it appears happened, because we read in the end of chapter 11 of 1 Kings that uh, verse 40, Solomon sought therefore to put Jeroboam to death, and he arose and fled to Egypt. Well, you could say, what almost looks like, well, gee, you heard that this guy got promised from God, and so I'm going to nix God's program by getting rid of him, more likely there was a, a lot of Jeroboam deciding to jump ahead and take it ahead of time. And now you see him going to Shechem, a place in Ephraim of significance in Ephraim. And not only are they going there, but look at the next verse. Now it came about when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was yet in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon while he was living in Egypt. They sent, who sent? somebody in Ephraim they sent and called him that Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam do you understand why they're in Shechem right now it's because Jeroboam and Ephraim and all the dissidents that he's been working with correspondents out of Egypt all this time said let's tell him if he wants to rule he needs to come up here to this significant place in our territory and we're going to do it here and then they get them all gathered up and Jeroboam comes down and says well wait a minute just before we before we get on with this ceremony there's just a couple little things we need to work out here and they place their demands on Rehoboam here's the deal we need this out of you because your dad was so hard on us they said verse 4 your father made our yoke hard Therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and then we will serve you. Were they serious? Maybe. Maybe they were serious. Maybe if they just, this had worked out. What do you think they knew? Jeroboam's young, he's smart. Remember who he was? What did he do for Solomon before he got in trouble? He was in the labor. He's the labor department. Yeah, he was in the labor department. He was in charge of the forced labor for recruiting labor for Solomon's project for Joseph. It says over Joseph, which is Ephraim and Manasseh, the, the two tribes. So he is a guy who's smart, ambitious, as we said. He knows the inside. He knows the government. He's worked for Solomon. Does he know Rehoboam? Oh, you bet he does. He knows who's next in line. He knows what's going to happen. So when they... Do you think they just called him up and said, hey, come on up. We need a figurehead out of Egypt. I think there's reason to believe that he's running the show from Egypt and they say, hey, he's, Solomon just he keeled over. Time to come home. And he pulled up stakes and came back. It's interesting. I think there is some evidence that he also maintained diplomatic relations with Egypt all this time. And I think it's going to show up later. Just a few years down the road. Really interesting little story. There's nothing that says he does, but it just looks suspicious. So we'll look at that as we go. So here we go. Rehoboam goes up there. And you wonder... What is going on in his head? Is he all honored and is he flabbergasted because, <laughs> gee, everything's looking so good? Is it because, man, these guys want me to come up, they want to make me king here? Is he pleased with that? Is he proud of that? Is he, you know, what, what's his reasoning? Why would you go there? 
if you think you're such hot stuff, why wouldn't you just say, no, you come down to Jerusalem. This is the place. I don't know. It's really odd. They must know how to push his buttons or somehow appeal to him. So he goes up there and he's sitting there in the conference and he wisely says, give me three days. Maybe he's just egotistical and thinks that he's got the kingship or divine right and everything will yeah. go smoothly. Okay, we'll go up there and we'll get this thing sealed and all Israel is going to come. Nibbon may also have not wanted to isolate himself surrounded by Jeroboam's men. Jer Jerusalem is a fort. Right. And yeah. he was safer where he could make an escape. <coughs> oh boy, yeah, Jeroboam would not want it to come to Jerusalem because that would have been the stronghold of Judah and not a good place to start any kind of trouble. So Jeroboam was really smart in finding a way to lure him to Shechem. And it's like Rehoboam never really clicked the danger he was in until later. So, so he goes up there, go away. And of course, we know the story we talked about last time. Rehoboam, like the smart guy he was, tells the old counselors that said, oh, you know, if you just give in to this, give in a little, give them what they want here. Hey, they'll serve you and everything will be great. And of course, the question hangs out there. Would it have really worked? Would they have found another excuse? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. So the thing is, it tells us this was from God, that this was going to work out this way. He had this all engineered because he said, I'm going to do this thing in Rehoboam's time. But what amazes me is that he goes, and he's sitting and you look where he's at, and you look at this place, and he's surrounded by all of Israel, and he gets up there. Would you look out at all these guys? And your home base is 34 miles of road back down, winding through the mountains back to Jerusalem. Would you tell them, you turkeys, you're going to pay? Did you hear that? You didn't hear that, day when he said that you turkey. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's look all the way down in verse 13. And the king answered the people harshly, be turkey. For he forsook the advice of the elders which they had given him, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, and I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word, which the Lord spoke, spoke through Ahijah the Shilhonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all Israel saw the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. <coughs> They said, ah, just what we wanted. Can you see Jeroboam out there going, yeah. Man, he took the bait. He grabbed that hook, line, and sinker and ran with it and, you know, fish on. Just what we knew was going to happen and just what we wanted. It's like they engineered that. I mean, it's from the Lord, but I'm sure. Okay, well. <laughs> hey, any port in a storm is fine. Doesn't matter. Sometimes etiquette has to be. Yeah. Well, there are some things more important than yeah. worrying about those That's details. Right. So, and everybody on the video <laughs> is going to wonder what is. <laughs> hey, we're in a Sunday school, and there are little ones there. So, anyway, so we got this thing engineered. And, and they are got to be just, all right, we're so happy. And Rehoboam, you would think, would go, oh, no. But he immediately starts figuring out, oh, man, man i, I got to go back and renegotiate this thing. There's got to be a way to talk them back into, no, no, that was a rash thing. That they shouldn't have done that. Because uh, it did mention that this side note, verse 17, for as the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So he kept a few. Then Rehoboam wants to 
talk this thing over some more. So he's really smart. The king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the forced labor. Got to think about that. And all Israel did what to him? Stoned him. Stoned him to death. And you got to think about it. You're going to send somebody up. You're either going up to tell them to shape up and to pay up and show up for labor, or you send him up as a negotiator to argue your case. Who would you send to this group that just said, forget you, we're out of here? You send the guy who's in charge of forced labor, just the fact that he shows up and they go, I know you, and what you re you wouldn't even give him a chance to say a word. It's, he's here to collect, forget it, he's going to die. And now all of a sudden, the bells and whistles go off. King Rehoboam made haste, I love that English word, he made haste to mount his chariot and flee to Jerusalem. Oh my gosh, I'll tell you he made haste, I'll bet you what, he was throwing sandals and, and he is lucky he got out of town, quite frankly. I think the reason he made haste is because the swords and spears were rattling behind him and they were after him. So, time frame, they tell Rehoboam Ray Ray no, he stays in town. Yeah, can you believe that? And send somebody. And send somebody over to negotiate. Good idea. You just go, what did he not see that day? Send the tax collector over. Yeah, send the tax collector over to tell him, let's negotiate this thing. You know, come on, guys. Do you really think that it was, it was in the form of negotiation, or was it more in the form of hard-handed... You guys Again. will do this okay, for me here's because our, I'm the king. And, here's the heavy. He's coming to collect you yeah. guys for get the next work detail. Yeah, I somehow don't I don't think that he was there to compromise or negotiate yeah. with them. Commentators, you know. most of them either skip it or think that he was sent as a negotiator, but uh, they don't give you any basis for why that's right. that way. And I tend to lean a little with your, as you look at that, that he might have been so blind, he said, oh, it's dumb dumbs, we're just going to send the guy down there, we're so tough, we're so, you know, they'll just, they'll wilt when we send the, the labor guy down there to yeah. chain him up and bring him or whatever, round him up. It's kind of like sending an auditor, you know, the IRS, Yeah. you think you have to. Yeah, we're going to put the fear yeah, in them. Yeah, we're just going to put the fear in them. He did. Yeah, we put something in them, but it wasn't fear that day. So, now we have a wreck in the nation. And when it came about, verse 20, all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. So there we go. It's it's done deal. They When the word's out now to the larger masses that Jeroboam is here and he stood up to that king and now, oh boy, he is our man. We are off and running in Judah. Now you find out that there were a few others that went with him as we struggle through the what all happened here and try to get down to the so what. But we do find out, look at verse 21, when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, uh, lucky to be there, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors. He still hasn't totally given up on this idea. To fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. He's ready to go back out there with an more army and we're going to get this thing back. He's still bent on that. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, you must not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come about from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord, and returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam then goes on and Moved, he built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. Why I promised to Jeroboam to die? Yeah, I was just going to ask the same thing. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And in fact, it actually looks like 
I don't know if we'll have time today, but if you go to Chronicles and you want to go read ahead, you'll find out. It's interesting. When you read Kings, you're going to feel like a ping pong ball because you're going to bounce over to the kings of Israel, back to the king of Judah, over to the king of Israel, and back to the king of Judah. And it gets so mixed up. This king took over in the such a year of that king, and that king took over, and, and it's really confusing. When you go to Chronicles, what you find is it follows the line of Judah only. They're following Judah and what happened in Judah in more detail. And so you get more of the inside scoop of what's going on in Judah and only faint references to anything in Israel and only those things that directly impact them when there's some a war or a negotiation or something like that. So it always follows more of Judah. And what you find is that Rehoboam actually spent three years or so being a little smarter. And he actually pulls in his horns. It's almost like suddenly you know, some bells and whistles started going off. And he starts waking up a little bit. One of the things that made a major influence is when this thing all went down, Jeroboam has a problem. And we'll look at it in more detail next time. But his problem is right back here in Jerusalem. Because three times a year, as a good Jew, you are required to do something. Go to the temple for the specified feasts. That is a huge problem for Jeroboam. Why? Because they go back home into Judah. And they see what's going on with Rehoboam and with all those sort of things. And it gives time for them to get lobbied. And the glorious temple. Is and the there. glorious temple and the presence of the Lord and all that stuff. And they're fearful that the religious <laughs> influence and all that will draw them back to the their loyalty to God and their therefore loyalty back to the line of Judah and Jeroboam wants none of that. So Jeroboam solves that problem by establishing a place right out here with a golden calf on it. And it's and he also puts one up here in Nam. And he says, there's the place you go to worship. So you'll no longer go down there. We'll look at that in more detail, but you've got to think all of a sudden, and now the other thing that he does, he says, and by the way, let's see, who wants to be a priest today? Would you like to be a priest? Okay, yeah, good. Okay, what tribe are you from? Simeon? Ah, oh, that's all right. Don't worry about that. And you, oh, you'd like to be a priest, and you're from, the, and from any tribe, any place, any state in life. You want to be a priest, you all come down. we got a priest training class starting next week. <laughs> and we're going to train you, and you can be a priest here and help people worship at that place. Here is the place that represents your God, and it... Remember, your God, when you were brought out of Egypt and your people worshipped the golden calf as you came out of it, remember that? That's what I thought. You'd think that the hair on the back of their neck would stand up and they would know better. Yeah. Because of history to them. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Wasn't it considered ancient history, though? It was probably, what, four, five hundred years yeah, was prior? Long, that was a long time ago. Yeah, don't you remember the stories about they worshipped there? So here, it, here they are. Here they are, that golden calf again. And when that happens and you're a Levite or a priest in the tribes, what do you do? You have now been pitched out because... You know why he doesn't want them in there? Same reason. Their faith would pull them back to Jerusalem. Back. You don't want any tithe. So, Levites, you're out. Where do you go? Back to Jerusalem and Judah. If you are one who is not willing to go with the golden calves, and you're not willing to go that way, what are you going to do? Your nation's crumbling around you. What do you do? Go back to Jerusalem, back to Judah. What does that do for the nation of Judah and Rehoboam? All that influence of those who are still wanting to be faithful to their God are brought back to Jerusalem, back to Judah, and that influence, I think, shows up 
when he started, all those priests and everybody started coming into town. I think it actually starts some bells and whistles. Somebody talked to him. I don't know what, but Rehoboam suddenly wakes up a little bit and realizes, hey, this is real. We need to pay attention to this. We talk about the leaders, but surely the people are telling the grandmother Rattler's stories and surely the people should be saying wait a minute yeah. you would think so but it's amazing what transpires within these nations as we study as we go forward it is really fascinating to watch what happens and what just I mean, we see the leaders but what you're going to see is the people and the tribe that is most fascinating to me is this one. Let me read you a quote of the way one of the prophets looks at it. Let's see if I can find it. It's in Jeremiah chapter 8. I want to say. Yeah. This is further down the road as the nation of Judah is coming, facing it. And that's when Jeremiah is in Jew Jerusalem trying to wake people up that don't go the way that Israel's already gone. This is way down the line. But it said, uh, if I can get my eyeball on it. Uh, trying to, oh, I'm too far. That was the one. Oh, it's chapter 3. It's earlier than I was thinking. In verse 11 of chapter 3 of Jeremiah, And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. And it's really interesting. What you see in Israel is they lost their faith in this, and as a nation, they never turned around. They, they went into the calf worship and that sort of thing, and they steered, you know, and they took... The, there's a little... You'll see the Baal worship when you had Ahab and Jezebel. Jezebel, a Phoenician, brought that in with her, and it really got established there. But that's really the, the major time. The rest of the time, this thing in Jeroboam, every king after him, it says, and he followed in the sin of Jeroboam, which was he kept these false religious... And it was just a little off. They still were worshiping the supposed one God with these other representation things, you know. So it's just a hair off, and they lost their faith, and they never turned back, said Israel was faithless all, faithless all the time. But said the other one was treacherous because they played the game of being faithful in Jerusalem, and they still had the temple thing going. But they had on all the high places, and as you read about these kings, they are measured by not just what they did personally, but did they clear out the high places and were they ever able to remove the Asherah and the Baalim and all these other idol worship that just brought itself into Judah? And if it was purely on the basis of what Judah and the nation and the people did, they would have been smoked a long time before they were. The only reason that they lasted as long as they did is because God said, I made a promise to David over and over <coughs> again. He says, I made a promise to David. And these folks were treacherous in that they pretended to be religious over at the temple. And then they turned right around. Remember we talked about that the, the king that was... Uh, over here, worshiping on the Mount of Olives at the idol, offering his children up. Where was that? And you can turn right around and look right across at the temple on the other side. Yeah. Just gives you goosebumps <laughs> thinking about that. That here you are worshiping this pagan thing, and right over there is that temple. This is a reminder of the one God that brought you out of the land, that did all these things, that put you here all those promises and it says they were treacherous and they were condemned for it. Interesting. So, we're about out of time. Fascinating watching the politics and the, the interplay of personalities and the 
it's just like reading yesterday's news, or actually today's news, as you see these world powers and stuff vying for things. And the other thing that we haven't even begun to get to yet is all these other powers around there are watching this place crumble. And they are lining up. Boy, I'm going to get my piece. We're going to get even. And a really interesting one to me is these guys down here in Egypt. They are waiting. And Rehoboam gets three years of getting really smart and starting trying to follow and be faithful. And then he kind of falls off the wagon. And all of a sudden, these guys, God just brings them right up here. How do they keep an inside scoop on what's going on up there? Well, they have their spies and everything. But I just wonder, yeah. I think that they must have had one wild grapevine because <laughs> nothing happened that everybody didn't know about it in no time. Stuff, news traveled. You know, donkeys and camels travel yeah. faster than you think, I guess. And the other thing is, this guy up here, Shechem. <coughs> What connection did he still have down here? If you were going to try, if you had this thing going with Rehoboam, and you wanted to sneak in there, and you knew you didn't dare come on and hit him head on, because you kind of know that he's got this God that looks out for him, what would you do? Would you do a frontal attack, or would you go down here and say, you know, there is a lot of treasure in that city. <laughs> They got a lot of good stuff, and you know, that Rehoboam, he is not all that bright. <laughs> It'd be an easy mark. It'd be easy. You know, all those guys had so many wives and concubines, they probably had them gossiping around them. Yeah, you wonder, they called mom, you know, and <laughs> said, hey, you know what's going on? You know, you know a lot of things yeah. can fly around. You never know, yeah, but where are the channels? Everybody in that area goes through there. Right. Yeah. The That's a major trader. Lots of stuff going on. It's interesting, though, when Rehoboam goes out and reinforces everything, do you know where all those cities are? They don't know where some of them existed. They guess where some of them were. But they do know the general areas. Do you know where they all are? You would think you would put them here, wouldn't you? Because that's your battles with Jeroboam to the north. you know where they all are? Why? Why? Egypt, Philistines. That's where the trouble was. That's where he sent his kids. That's, all that stuff. So interesting to try and speculate on, wonder what's going on. And all the time, God's sitting out there and he says, I got a plan. I got a plan. Hello? Well, I got a promised. plan. He, he promised. I got a From promise. From the very beginning, he promised. And. Really, all of this, it's like, you know, you look at this board and it's like this and this and all this stuff going on and stuff. And it's like, you know what, he was going to carry it out no matter, and he did things purposely, you know, to carry out that plan and to carry out that purpose. And to me, I mean, that's, I, I, I look at that and I just think, wow, <clears throat> that's all I kept my mind on today was just his promise yeah. to the very end, you know that myself, when I sin or when I'm carrying on or I do separate <coughs> other things going on in the world, it really takes a lot of uh, pressure and stress mm -hmm. off of me when I just think God's it's in control. control. He's, he's yeah. got this plan and yeah. it's going to carry out no matter what man does. One other thing I suggest is you go read ahead to see if I'm pulling your leg or not or if this is true. <laughs> Hope you will. As you go read ahead and you look at these guys, I want you to watch one little ingredient in each of these kings that I think reflects also the nation. You watch them. They'll have a tough time and they will seek the Lord sometimes. You'll see them and they'll start to curve up and they'll do well. And just like Rehoboam, there'll be some comment about when they were strong. And then all of a sudden, they decide to go off and chase the idol or whatever. And somebody and, and then they'll have, oh my goodness sakes, and there's a Rehoboam story right there. Oh my goodness sakes, we and here comes Egypt, what do we do, oh Lord? And then they'll have a little 
turn up again and God say, okay, I heard you. You heard me. And remember that prayer that Solomon prayed? Lord, when this happens or that happens or that happens or that happens, would you turn our hearts back to you and you can see this process happening. But every time there's a catastrophe, almost without fail, it's right there. They go off and make a deal. They go off and do something because I'm strong. And all I have to do is go home, walk in the bathroom, and look at the mirror and say, have you seen that pattern before? And they want to go, duh. Yeah. Human nature. You don't go pulling, digging in your Bible, looking for answers when you're strong, because everything's good. Man, the budget's under control. The farm's going good. Everything's great. Things are wonderful. When do you go there is when the, when the diagnosis comes in. Someone in your family or you personally have some illness. Or the stock market crashes and you, all your savings are gone. Or you, know, there's, you come home and your house is in cinders. Or some catastrophe in your life. And you go, oh my gosh, Lord. Isn't that us? Boy. You will see that pattern over and over and over here. It's like God going, whoa, Ron, wake up. And, uh oh. God must really get tired of us. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it great that he has patience? Yes. I'm glad that he has much patience because that he says, I'm here and I've made a promise and I'll stand by it. And it does not matter what you do. That's the one thing I want you to take home. Wherever you find yourself in this mess, that God says, I am here, I made a promise, I am not turning away from that, and he follows it all the way through and on beyond that. So let's close. We're out of time. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. As we look at this crazy time in the, in the life of the nation, and all this stuff going on and the changes they faced and the challenges in their leaders and in themselves as uh, they became comfortable with the success. They whined and moaned about the weight that Solomon had put on them, and probably rightly so, but at the same time, we know that, that silver was as common as dirt. It was considered no value in the nation of Israel during this time because they were so wealthy and yet they're complaining. Father, help us to be careful when we're successful, when things are good. Help us as an individual and as a nation to be aware that uh, what we have is a gift from you that has been handed to us by your grace and that uh, it can be removed when you see the benefit to us to do so. Father, help us to have our eyes on you and be thankful to the giver and not caught up with the gift. Help us not to fall into the air of these folks who, when they became strong, became proud and arrogant and thought they didn't need you anymore. Father, help us to realize that we need you always and uh, give you praise and honor and glory in the good that we have and even the difficult times that we can praise you and that you're working in our lives. And we look to see the fruit of that labor. We thank you, Father, for our time together this morning. In Jesus' name.